Hi, Robert. Hi. So creations is a topic that is perennially confusing to course students. Uh, it's a running joke here at the circle that no matter how many times you try and explain it to me, it never quite goes in. And yet this is a topic that course students really have to understand if you are going to understand the course's thought system. So here we are on creations. <laughs> it's true. And I've been alerted recently to just what a frequent, persistent question this is, not just by, you know, you asking it, but we've been doing Repeatedly. those. <laughs> we've been doing those QA classes. And it just comes up again and again and again. You know, I'll I've been answered or been asked it and answered it in probably, you know, four of those classes. Yeah, and one thing that I will say from my own experience on this topic is that I really thought that I could take creations, put it in a box and say, well, that's something that I can't really understand. But I'm, I've been surprised at how often it pops up throughout the course. And so it's like, oh, there it is again and again and again. And so you really kind of have to get it um, because you can't escape it. You can't really escape it. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things where all of our instincts mentally are to go in the wrong direction. Right. Okay. Well, let's see if we can't clear this up again. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think the place to start to make it more than just a purely theoretical exercise is to realize what a huge thing the creative impulse is in our psyche, in our nature. There is such a deep-seated impulse to create something yeah. in the normal sense of the word. And you think that's just because we want to make a contribution or we want to leave some piece of us behind? What is driving that creative impulse, do you think? I think it's what's driving all the basic impulses in our nature. It's just been, it's been built into what we are. We want to produce something that is beautiful, that is lasting, that is valuable, and that is an expression of who we are. And that just runs so deep in us. And I think you can see it. I mean, we think of it in relation to artistic things, but it goes so far beyond that. You know, I, when I was a kid, I'd planned to be an artist. So I, you know, spent tons of time drawing and I don't draw anymore, but I write and I cook, and I do other things. And the weird thing is, is that in the end, drawing a picture doesn't feel totally different from writing an article or a book or even making food for people. There's something essential that all those things have in common that answers a need. Yeah, and, and the need is so base. Uh, would you put it because we all have that need to express ourselves in some way. It's like a longing within mm -hmm. us. Would you put it on the level of like the miracle impulse of the miracle impulses that, that desire in us to express love? Would you put the creative impulse on a level like that? Like we need to contribute and extend ourselves in some way? I think the miracle impulse is an example of how the creative impulse manifests in this world. It's from the course's standpoint, the example, but it's still just a reflection of the true creative impulse as it exists in heaven. Okay. So there's something in us that is hardwired in that needs to create. Let's start there. Right. Okay. Right. So okay. we'll go, we'll go to your, your sheet here. Okay. Yeah. I've got 10 points. And the first one is talking about not just our creations, but creation as a term in the course, which probably more often than not is about God's creation. So my first point is the course defines creation as the creating of eternal spirit in heaven. In contrast to normal usage, therefore, the term creation in the course does not apply to this world. And that's something that is very difficult for people to get. So, you know, in the West, we've been brought up thinking that the world is God's creation. You know, if you're a believer in God, where else did the world come from? And yet, when the Course uses the word creation, 
it's never talking about anything of this world, anything of form. In its view, what God created was pure spirit, and that's us. You know, we, in, in truth, are pure spirit. We are his creation. The mountains, the trees, the oceans, the stars, none of that in the course is God's creation. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because there, there's so there's so much in the course that connects back to the Bible, and yet, I mean, the Bible explicitly says that God created the world. You know, spent six sure. days doing it, and right. so, um, so how do you square that? Well, they just don't agree, but it's a different vision of God. Mm-hmm. If you think of a God. And what he, you know, mainly what he creates, what his handiwork is, is mountains and oceans and planets and stars and all that. Well, you don't have to think about it too long before you realize that it's a realm full of suffering and death. Mm -hmm. Now picture God and what he creates is beings that are perfect, that are limitless, that are holy that are pure spirit, there's nothing perishable about them, and that's his handiwork, that's his masterpiece, is creating these living, perfect minds. Those are different gods. Yeah, and this is how our conversations extend to like five hours, but so when, you, when the Course says that grains of sand are part of the sonship, like everything here is part of the sonship, even though God didn't create it, well, what created it? Well, he says the form of the grain of sand is not God created. There is a consciousness associated with that grain of sand. However dim and you know asleep that consciousness is, that's what God created, not, not the sand we see. Mm-hmm. So are you saying that the sand is somehow conscious? Well, He says, how holy is the smallest grain of sand when it is seen as part of the completed picture of God's son? God's son is conscious. So, yeah. It's amazing. I think there's consciousness associated with a much wider variety of things in this world than we normally think. And the Course has all kinds of hints of that. But the point is, is that God didn't create the forms. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a quote that I've, I've, I've been quoting for years and years and years from the text that says, in this world, it is impossible to create. It's just one line. There are other lines in the course that say basically the same thing, but it's so direct and it's so emphatic. It's just important to take that in. Everyone wants our creations and even God's creations to be something we can point to in this world. But in this world, it is impossible to create. And that is because, well, I was going to say that's impossible because only God creates, but the whole point of this whole thing is that we create. <laughs> so <laughs> so let's, yeah. go, let's go back to your, your first point here. Uh, see, you see what I did there? I'm taking you back to your sheet. Um, that's great. Unusual. Yeah. yeah. So when you say we create eternal, well, in the Course says we create eternal spirit in heaven, what does that mean? Can you flesh that out a bit? Well, that actually takes us to the second point. Oh, okay. Well, because the first point is about creation in general, not specifically about our creation. Okay. Creations. Okay. So you, the, I feel like I always pull you down on your sheets without you fully feeling like the points are fleshed out. So, is there anything that you want to say on point number one? Just that it's really essential to get. This creation is a technical term in the course. It's one of its most technical terms, and it does not refer to anything of form. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So point number two. Our creations are therefore eternal spirit in heaven. Their nature is exactly the same as our own true nature. They are pure spirit, formless, holy, and changeless. They are completely real, even if we do not know them now. Now, the basic idea is that everything in heaven is, in essence, the same. It all has the same attributes, right? It's all spirit. It's all formless. It's all holy. It's all changeless. Um, Because God 
created his co-creators. And he, in doing so, he created them like him. So it's all the same in heaven, even if there is some sense of multiplicity. There's God, there's the Son, there's the sons, there's the Holy Spirit. There is a sense of... Angels. <laughs> angels, right. There's a sense of distinction. Dave between. Diamond. <laughs> God. Um, so, I'm sorry, you have to listen to the Angels podcast to get that joke, but... Yeah. Okay, so um, it's all the same, but there still are causes and effects. There are beings that are cause and beings that are effect. We are the effect of God. Our creations are the effect of us, really the effect of us with God. And I want to read this passage because this says it really well, I think. This is from the text. A co-creator with the Father, that's us, must have a son. So we as co-creator with God must have a son. And sometimes, very rarely, our creations are talked about as a son or sons. This is one of those cases. Yet must this son, our son, our creation, have been created like himself, like us. And then as a colon, so here's how our son was created, or what our son was created as, which is just like us. A perfect being, all-encompassing, and all-encompassed. Nothing to add and nothing taken from, not born of size, nor weight, nor time, nor held to limits or uncertainties of any kind. So that's the nature of our sun, our creations, and that's our nature too. So Robert, are we creating new beings or are we just circulating what has always been? Well, it wouldn't be creating if it was the second, would it? But I always thought that whatever God like God, everything that has, that God created has already been created. And so I, I guess I was thinking that we were just extending our being versus creating something completely new. Those are the same thing. How are they the same thing? We should go on to the next point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So third point through our creating, we add to the kingdom. We extend it outward and thus increase its scope. And I've just gone through and vacuumed up all the references to our creations in the course. And this point is made over and over again. Basically, by extending our being and thus bringing into being our creations, which are something quote unquote new, even though the word new shouldn't be used in relation to eternity. There's a sense in which, you know, they've always been because there is, you know, in eternity, it's always, always. There's, there is no past in eternity. Um, but we bring them into being. And by doing that, we add to the kingdom. The kingdom increases because of our creative activity. So I know we're going to talk about children at, at some point in, in this, but is it analogous to the these we have a child and therefore we've created something new in the world. And yet that child's, it's my understanding that child's soul had, has always existed. And so the soul is coming through it. The soul lived before, but it's coming through us. So it's extending through us into something that seems new, i.e. a kid, but the soul was always there. Is that? But that's God's creation, that soul. Yeah, but we are ours. But we are extending it. Not really. We're just providing a vehicle, a physical body for it. Isn't that the same thing as extending it? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I mean, remember it's impossible to create in this world. So, you know, what we're doing in heaven, basically what we're doing in heaven, we'll, and we'll get here eventually, is the exact same thing God did when he created us. So any, any way in which you're going to imagine our creation to be, or our creating to be different than God's creating is not going to be correct because we are doing exactly what he did. I have no idea why people are so confused on this topic. None. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on, on the topic of, on this point of we add to the kingdom or we increase the kingdom, that's a pretty amazing thing. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the creative impulse is to make a contribution. We all want to make a lasting contribution. And we think of that as a contribution on the level of this world. Imagine getting to make an eternal contribution, eternal. And that contribution is made to, to heaven, to God's infinite kingdom. I mean, that is way better than getting to invent something that people use for centuries on this earth. Yeah, and that's something that I think that we can understand by going back to that example of children, which I know we're going to touch on further. But like we we create children, or we we make children, and and we extend our being through our children, and then their love comes back to us, and that fulfills us. And so, I mean, that cycle is something that I'm just trying to think of examples that make this concept somewhat relatable to us. Yeah. And that seems to be one way that we can grab onto it. It's like an earthly reflection of mm -hmm. heavenly creation. It's not mm -hmm. creation. And we don't create those souls. And we don't create the bodies they come into because it's impossible to create in this world. But it's all a mirror on earth of what we do in heaven. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's, and that's, that's really our best, I think, analogy. It's better than artistic creation, I think, because in artistic creation, you don't, you don't produce anything that is aware, right? Your paintings aren't aware, mm -hmm. um, but children are. And so that is, I think, the best example or earthly reflection of what's going on on the real level when we create. And, and when you were like... You, we are creating something new. I guess the reason why I'm going back to the, the child example is I remember um, you did a Q&A recently and someone asked a question about abortion. And they said, what, what, is, what happens to that soul when a child is aborted? And your answer was, well, it just goes on to the next. And so... When we think about what has what God has already created, and we're just extending that, like I'm having a hard time grasping that what we create is new. I just think we're vessels for what has already been created. So, can we get clear on that before we move on? Well, just you know, what do you picture God doing when He created us in heaven? Extending His being and bring into being something quote unquote new, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he created us, we are aware, we're sentient, and we weren't there before he created us, even though there's no before technically in eternity. That's what we do. Isn't that amazing that we have that capability? That's the, that I think is the part that is the most important part to wrap our minds around, or at least try, because I think that's the block. Mm-hmm. We think, well, how could we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's you... my next point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So number four is as hard as it is to accept that we have the power, power to create just like God, we have to have that power. He created us to be like him. And first and foremost, he is a creator. Now, the bedrock of everything in the Course is God and His creation of us. Everything rests on that. And, and the whole idea is that when He created us, He created us to be like Him. He gave us all of His attributes. Okay? Well, I think Course students accept that. I mean, it's everywhere in the Course. And yet, once you accept that, then this has to be because if he gave us all of his attributes, well, one of them is that he's a creator, right? Yeah. So we have to be a creator in the same way that he is. We have to be. And yet, we've spent some time on this podcast talking about the uh, hierarchy in the order of creation. And so, I mean, obviously, God is our creator, and we're right. creating our creation. So right. you want to say anything about that? Can you say a bit more? 
Okay. Well, when we, when we talked in the angels podcast about um, angels being a different realm of creation and cre- and they have a role of nurturing and protecting us and our purpose. And I'm wondering if in the hierarchy of creation, if our creations have some sort of role as well. Well, they'd have to have a role because you know we are giving them all of our attributes like God gave us all of his and you know part of being us is having a role our role is creation and what's their role well presumably they create too i mean i the course never talks about that it never talks about it never goes past that level but logically speaking i would think they would have to okay Okay. So to me, this is, this is a really big point because I've been thinking, can it really be, you know, for years, like course says we have these creations, no other teaching that I've ever came, come across talks about us having creations in this sense. A lot of teachings talk about us being co-creators with God, but they always talk about it in my experience in a more earthly sense. We, we co-create with God things in the universe of form. So here the Course seems to stand alone, talks about it over and over again. Can it really be true? And what I've just recently realized is it has to be. If God created us like himself and he's a creator, then he has to have, has to have created us to create. Yeah, and I guess... I, I, you're right. I mean, the, the, the block is how can we do this? And the second block is, okay, well, if we're creating in heaven and we have like zero awareness of the fact that we're doing this, that's where I think the disconnect is. Yeah. How in touch can we be with the fact that we're creating if we're really not in touch with it at all? He does say repeatedly that we can know our creations when we want to, but you don't really hear about people having experiences that they label as experiences of their creations. I know. We're like deadbeat parents of our creations because we don't know they're there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the big hurdle, though, is thinking that we, we don't think it's hard to imagine God having this power to create living minds. And that's part of being God. We just have a hard time imagining that we can do that. Do you think also part of the disconnect is that we don't even recognize that from a course perspective, we're in heaven right now creating and, and that our, what we, our direct experience here on earth is an illusion, it's a dream. And so if we're not aware of the fact that we're in this dream and that we're ultimately in heaven, then we're not aware of the fact that we're creating in heaven right yeah, now. Of course, of course. So, so we aren't aware. It's completely outside our awareness. I think though that we need to change the question from how can we do this to how can we not do this? Mm-hmm. Because if God created us like himself, then we have to have this power. Okay. Where do you want to go from here? Okay. So let's see here. One thing I want to point out, and this is what, got me to realize the point I've just been making. There's a passage in chapter seven in the text where he says this, you, are there, you therefore are willing to look at the ego's premises, but not at their logical outcome. Is it not possible that you have done the same thing with the premises of God? So we'll, we'll, we'll look at God's premises like he created us like himself, but we won't look at the logical outcome of those premises. And then it says, your creations are the logical outcome of his premises. And I realized that's exactly what I've been doing. I've not been realizing or looking at the fact that the logical outcome of what the Course says about God and him creating us is that we must create ourselves and have our own creations. And the Course says that God created us because he didn't will to be alone. So do you think that's why we create too, because we don't will to be alone? 
Maybe so. I mean, we're already not alone because we're with God. But that creative impulse, that there is something in us that just wants to take the very best in us, to extend it outward and produce something that is lasting and beautiful and valuable. That's just so deep in us. And I think that what we can do with that urge in us now is to say, well, that's a little tiny reflection of the urge we have in heaven. Yeah. And that goes back to, it, it, at, at one level, it goes back to that creative impulse where you were talking about, I like to cook for other people. I like to draw. I like to write. You know, that's, that's that need in us to create. But uh, kids are another part of that too. I've, I've shared with you and with many others that before I had my first son, I just remember feeling this complete well of love in me and it had no, I wanted to express it through a child. And so I've, it feels to me like that's something that we can relate to from this as well. Right, right. And like I said, that's the purest reflection on earth mm -hmm. because a child's alive and aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so my next point, number five, is we do not create by ourselves. We co-create with God and with all our brothers. So it's not that we're doing this in some kind of isolation. The Course says many times we are co-creators with God. He's creating through us. We're joining with his will in our creating. And it also says several times that we don't create apart from our brothers. So the whole sonship creates together. It's done in unison. Hmm. You think that is something that is mirrored here as well? I mean, it does take two to make a baby. So do you think that we have oh, some, yeah, right, uh, right. some, there has to be some form of joining in order to create here? Is that a reflection as well? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And so many things in this world are a collective effort mm -hmm. about, you know, the performance of a symphony, for instance. Um, and the Course likes music metaphors for heaven, talks about heaven as, as being this song. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I like that. Yeah. It's just interesting how much of this we do outside of our own awareness. What do you mean? Outside of our own direct awareness. I mean, all of this is going on in heaven. We do have these earthly mirrors as we've been trying to draw out, but... It's all, it's all happening. I mean, I, I'm not consciously aware of the fact that I'm joining with a whole sonship to create things in heaven. So that's what I mean. Yeah, but we're, just, we're not consciously aware of heaven. I mean, you know, the mind, the conscious mind is, is the tip of, of a very, very deep iceberg. Yeah, but to the, to the point of your point here, it is, um, it is repeated again and again and again throughout the course. I mean, I'm just always struck by how interpersonal it is. It is constantly asking us to come together with our brothers. Yeah, and one of the reasons it gives for doing that, for joining with our brother, acknowledging who our brother really is, is so that we can remember our creations. Because if he created us, if he created them with us, then how can we remember them without remembering the one we created them with? So that we can remember our creations, not so we can remember God himself or so that we can remember our creations and by remembering our creations, we remember God. Well, I mean, it's all of it. It's all the same. It's all yeah. of it. And, and the, big, the big one's God. Um, but the point is still made in the course that you won't remember your creations, which is a, an end in itself. It's not just a means to another end um, without also remembering the brother who co-created them with you. Yeah. And you can't remember God without remembering your brother too. So right. yeah. yeah. So it's all, yeah, it's all universal soup, isn't it? <laughs> but, there, but yeah, I, I, yes, what, it is. What were you going to say? What were you going to say? But it's, the, you know, there are chunks in the soup. It's not just all, <laughs> all blended. <laughs> I know. Um, it is quite a stew. It's quite a celestial stew. Um, and that's one thing that, that I uh, really took from, from our Angels podcast. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm referring back to that a lot, but it was a really powerful discussion. And we 
one of the things that I got out of it that I think applies here is we want to make all of the metaphysics of the course far more simplistic than they actually are. And, you know, in our angel discussion, you were repeating the idea that it is everything. It is God. It is the Holy Spirit. It is Jesus. It is angels. It is uh, loved one. I mean, it, all of it is there and it's all there to call upon in different ways. And in the case of our creations to remember in different ways. And so we're just constantly expanding our thinking in, in these things. And so uh, I think that uh, this is yet another reminder of just how much expanding there is to do. Yeah. One of the things that's helped me is to realize that just because in heaven all is one doesn't mean that it's all numerically one. Mm -hmm. You know, the Course talks about God's creations being in number infinite. Well, they exist in heaven and they are, quote, in number infinite. Mm -hmm. Which so means the they are... That, which means that they are distinct, right. but infinite. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, if, if you had to count them, the counting would never end. Yeah. So we have to, you know, I think we have to accept, rather than saying, well, I know what he really means. He means it's just all one. So we're all God, Holy Spirit's us, God's us, you know, we're each other, and that's it. There's just one. At that point, we're saying we know what heaven's like better than he does, because that's not what he's saying. Yeah, and I think that... But our desire is to make it simplistic so that we can put it, we can chunk it out in ways that we can understand it. Yeah, and yeah. so I think there, there needs to be more room, as you've been saying repeatedly, there needs to be more room for just the fact that this is what the Course says and you may not understand it, but let's at least be open to the fact that this is, this is what the Course is saying and it, and it could possibly be true. Well, and he does say in a number of places that specifically this idea of, of there being multiplicity and yet oneness so that, you know, one mind is every mind. He says, you can't understand that. You can't. And I think we sort of, you know, bristle at that somewhere in us. But think about it. If, if, you, if you tried to teach your dog physics, mm -hmm. would it work? Would your dog ever understand physics? No, the dog brain is not smart enough to get it. Well, we're working within a brain that's not too far up from the dog brain. Mm -hmm. We'll mm -hmm. never get this while in, using this brain. So what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next but, point. But I will say this. There, there are enough, as we've been saying throughout this podcast, there are enough mirrors here that enable us to at least grasp, punch through part of the concepts, right? Yeah, as long as we realize that they're just kind of stick figures that help us understand something we really can't understand. Yeah, okay. Okay, so my sixth point, which is a long one, it's an important one, creation is our joy, it is the unlimited fulfillment of our creative impulse. We are sad, depressed, and unfulfilled because we are not fulfilling our true function. Sadness over not fulfilling our function on earth is a surface manifestation of a larger, deeper sadness. The Course makes this point in several places. First of all, it makes the point that this is what we love doing. Just if you can imagine an artist in this world who can't stop himself from expressing that creative impulse, that's how we are in heaven. We just have an overwhelming desire to create. And then for that same reason, because it is impossible to create in this world, he says in several places, this is why we feel sad, why we feel unfulfilled, why we feel not at peace, and even why we feel guilty because we're not, we are dimly aware that we're, we're not fulfilling our true function. So something in us remembers that that's our function and realizes we're not doing it here, and that has all kinds of negative emotional consequences. Doesn't that seem unfair, though, that here we have this hardwired itch in us that we can never seem to scratch? Well, we can scratch it by waking up beyond this world. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if we could scratch it here, why would we ever leave here? <laughs> it is interesting, though, that we, because we all know that impulse. We all know that that desire to create in the world, whether it's through our art or, as I was saying before, I mean, I, I really, ha- I remember having like this, this ball of love in me and I was like I've got to get this to channel like I remember that um, Mm -hmm. so vividly and so that's you know why I had a kid and so I I think we do understand part of it but I, I do hear what you're saying too about when we miscreate that also causes us to feel guilty in some way because we recognize that we're not fulfilling our ultimate creative purpose because we are, we're not creating as an extending love. We're extending discord and chaos. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think just, there's just the very simple fact that you said that we're not doing the thing. I mean, there are in, in usual thinking sins of omission, right? Where you sinned by not doing something that you're meant to do. Well, there's a sense in which we feel we're making this colossal sin of omission. We're not fulfilling our truth function in heaven. So if someone is listening and they're like, yeah, I have that impulse. I I have that desire. What do I do with it? What would you tell them? Can we leave that to the 10th point? (laughs) Make a baby. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Follow Emily's advice. Make a baby. (laughs) Okay. I want to read a quote about this though. I should stop. That's terrible advice for, (laughs) you don't casually make babies. So I'm sure that goes without saying, or at least it should. Okay, so this is from chapter 7 in the text. In this depressing state, the Holy Spirit reminds you gently that you are sad because you are not fulfilling your function as co-creator with God and are therefore depriving yourself of joy. So there is this direct link, link between earthly sadness and depression and not fulfilling our heavenly function. There's some dim awareness that we've got that function, that we're not doing it, and that has actual emotional consequences in this world. That is fascinating. Isn't it? So then, but again, like, what do we do about it? Because... So what you should think is that ball of love in you, Mm -hmm. ultimately that was about not creating in heaven. Well, I could have saved myself a lot of money by having that kid if I could go back. You speak of having children with such sacredness. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, Yeah. Okay. I'm glad that we're talking about this because we, we can all relate to that feeling and we don't know quite what to do with it. And I don't think that we're ever going to say, well, I'm having this depressed feeling because I'm not creating in heaven. But we can touch on I'm having I'm feeling depressed because I'm not extending love here on earth. Can we go that far? Like if somebody's feeling depressed, rather than going into the spiral of the depression, would a way to get out of it be saying, huh, I I should channel this into some form of extending love? Uh Oh, <laughs> sorry for those who are listening. Um, <laughs> Robert's door just opened. So I, I just had an office invasion. Office invasion. So we're back. And where would you like to pick up? Let's go on to point number seven, because because issues that that are occurring for you of how do we make this more practical? How do we, you know, fill that hole while we're still on earth? They're really coming at the end. Okay. Okay. So point number seven is our love for our children on earth is a tiny reflection of our love for our heavenly children who are our treasure. And they in turn love us for giving them the gift of life. So the course talks about how animals have this love for their offspring uh, and the need, and they have the need to feel, that, that they feel to protect them. Uh, and, he, and it says that we react to our ego that way, 
in, in, in the world, but that, he says, duplicates in many ways the way you will one day react to your real creations, which are as timeless as you are. So the way that animals respond to their offspring, the way that we respond to our ego, the way that we respond to our children as, as things that we produce and identify with is a little reflection of how we feel about our real creations. Yeah, and it, it's such a good point because the Course talks repeatedly about how protective and even cherishing we are of our ego. And I think that we can all identify with that. You know, we, we are protective of our grievances. We are protective of our judgments. And we do care for them in some ways like children. Um, so it, it's interesting to make that connection between the fact that we've made our own ego and therefore we, we are very protective of it. Yeah, and I think, that, I think that seeing the love we have for children as a little reflection of the love we have for our heavenly children is a really useful idea because the Course just talks on and on about what a major thing our creations are for us in heaven. Mm -hmm. It's like they are our joy. They are everything to us, and we want to get back to them, and they want us to get back to them. Hmm. Okay. And then and one last thing. Okay. Go ahead. I was going to say that takes us right into point eight. But yes. Okay. So point eight, our creations call us home through the Holy Spirit for they need us to return to them. And we in turn will only find our completion in them. I mean, imagine if, imagine if uh, on earth something analogous had happened where you fell into um, some kind of amnesia and you had children, and, and you, you left home and abandoned your children, and you were in some other area thinking you were somebody else, you would still somewhere inside feel that need to return to them, and they would be there dying for you to return to them. Mm -hmm. And there's some kind of analogous situation in heaven where we want to be back with the creations that make us complete, and they want us to be back with them. And they're calling to us through the Holy Spirit to return to them. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier, where we, we can identify with the love that we plant in our children and by, through the way that we treat them and how we express love to them. And they hold that love in them and give it back to us and that that is the cycle. And is that the cycle that calls us home to, to this? To the point? I guess so, because the idea behind creating in heaven is that it's unbelievably fulfilling. Yeah. You, know, you need that fulfillment. And it just feels like the course is full of these cycles. You know, we talk about a miracle being an expression of love that heals another person that in turn heals you. And there's constantly these interpersonal cycles going on. And this just feels like an, another, another one of them. This is the big one. And that one's an earthly reflection of this. Yeah. And it's interesting you say here, well, the course says that your creations communicate to you through the Holy Spirit. So if there are creations, why the intermediary? Well, I mean, our minds have, you could say, fallen so low. We need lots of intermediaries. It's not just the Holy Spirit. I mean, he uses intermediaries like angels, mm -hmm. like, like Jesus. Jesus is, is an intermediary. So, you know, let's just be glad we have him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting that... There are some things we've talked about in this podcast that communicate directly with us. You know, we were talking about the angels are communicating directly with us, and yet our creations are coming. They communicate to you through the Holy Spirit, and so that's just different. I think if our minds were open enough, we, of course, could communicate with them directly. It's just that, you know, we're in a pretty, pretty kind of base state here. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> But I do this idea that that they're calling us home and and we're seeking them is incredible. I mean, all of this is just happening. Yeah, and he around us. One of the things that struck me, and I kind of slipped it into one of the earlier points, but I'll say a bit more about it here, is how many times he says they are real. 
So just in case we're thinking, well, he's talking about our creations. It's just some nice flowery language to make us feel better. He repeatedly says they're real. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So point number nine, our spirit quote has not ceased to create end quote. Our creations remain safe in God's mind and in our own. We have simply dissociated them, but we can know them at any time we really want. If we knew them, we would instantly give up this world to be with them. I've joined a lot of points together here, but he says several times, we're still creating, even though part of our mind is split off from, from that state. Uh, our creations remain safe in heaven. And he says that enough times as if we're worried about that on some level, which I guess if you left your kids, you would be worried they were safe. They're still in our mind. We've just dissociated them. So we just put a partition in our mind that makes it seem like they're not in our mind. Which is a really interesting point because if we have uh, dissociated them, then that means we knew them and we've made some choice to do that versus never knowing them at all. But you can't create without knowing what you create. But we don't know that we are creating at all. (laughs) (laughs) Because of dissociation. (laughs) Another cycle. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the fact is, you know, we create by knowing something into being, you could say. Mm. You have to know it to create it. Um, It's just that we've dissociated from that whole state. Yeah. Not just the products of the creation, but the creation, the act of creation itself. And just the fact that we're here is testimony that we have dissociated, right? Like we right. are very present here. Okay. Right. I mean, this is, a, this is a tiny, tiny part of our total mind that's stuck in this weird dream or feels stuck. Yeah. But anyway, he, he seems to want to reassure us that you haven't stopped creating. Don't feel guilty. You know, your creations are safe. Don't worry about them. They're still in your mind. You don't have to feel separate from them. You can still know them. It's almost like he's speaking to some deeper upset in us, you know, fears, worries, guilt about this whole topic. And is what what we have created, do we create, do we have individual creations like our children in heaven? You know, I can identify my children as Christian and Liam. Or you were saying before that, the whole sonship is creating and the whole sonship is extending. So in, in that sense, we are the individual parents of uh, creations. Like are, are, is the whole sonship the parent or do we individually create? I think the whole sonship, it's like a symphony. You know, the whole orchestra is producing that symphony. Uh, so we're not going to go to heaven and be like, there you are. <laughs> Yeah, right. my, my, my creation, you know. Yeah, I think, I mean, creations is plural almost always in the course. So our creations are many, and I'm sure they're in number infinite. Uh, but I don't think there, that any one in particular is tied to any one of us in particular. Mm-hmm. Don't think so? Yeah, okay. So last point, number 10. The ego blocks extension on earth and thus blocks the remembrance of our function. Conversely, extension on earth opens our mind to creation and God. And there's a quote I love. It, it, if you, unless you know what it means in context, it seems rather vague and, and meaningless. But it's in a section that talks about how our mind, the mind's natural dynamic is extension. That's just what the mind wants to do. It's designed to do. And yet, in this world, that dynamic of extension, it, it tends to stop at the body, principally because the body we treat as an end in itself. So whereas the mind wants to extend to other minds, that impulse to extend stops at the body as we like fawn over the body and lavish attention on it and try to get our needs met through it. And so... He talks about that being us arresting our thought. Thought wants to extend out, but it gets arrested. It gets stopped at the body. 
then at the end of that section, he says, do not arrest your thought in this world and you will open your mind to creation in God. And translated, what that means is let your thought follow its natural dynamic of extending to your brothers. That's a mirror of extension in heaven. So by doing that, you open your mind to your true function of creating in heaven. And what that all means is if we want to get back to our heavenly children and the love we share with them and the fulfillment of creating them and all that, then what we do is we give miracles in this world. That is fascinating because that you're, it's so right. I mean, we, we do stop at the body. And that is what prevents us from extending love to everyone. We extend love to chosen ones based on what their body is doing, how it looks, how it's meeting our needs, as you said. And what they can do for our body. What they can do for our body. And so, gosh, that's a really interesting thing to think about is we would extend love, but it gets blocked by our perception of a body. Huh. Yeah. The other thing this makes me think is we should think of the creative impulse where we want to produce that thing that's enduring, that's valuable. We want to leave a legacy. We should think about that not in terms of form, but in terms of the legacy we leave in the minds of others. Say more about that. Well, you know, so often and maybe it's more a male thing, I don't know, but so often you think of the creative impulse as erecting this monument, you know, this painting, this statue, this, this uh, piece of music. Um, I think about it in terms of things I write. I used to think about it in terms of things I drew. But what he's really saying is the closest analogy is not leaving a legacy behind in terms of something of form, it's leaving a legacy behind in terms of your contribution to another mind, to other minds, which is more like having kids. Yeah. Right? So the miracles we do give gifts of love and healing and deposit those in those minds. It's invisible, but that's our real legacy. That's the real mirror of our creation in heaven, and that's what will help us remember that function of creating in heaven. That's really beautiful, isn't it? It is. It is. Because I think we all know, once you say that, you realize that is a more beautiful expression of the creative impulse than a painting. Yeah. When we talked about this earlier, I mentioned my grandmother and her Christmas stockings. And mm. I, her Christmas stockings, she's made for everyone in our family. And it was that was the way that she showed her love and we always thought oh that's 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 the universal symbol of mama's love it was these stockings but it's not in the to the point of what you're saying here it's that that stocking represented her love that that and thinking of them all year you know not just for one month reminds me of who she was it reminds me of the and it's that's her legacy is the love that she planted in my mind right right that's her legacy it has nothing to do with the thing that she created on earth it has to do with the thing she planted and the love that she gave and that's our legacy mm -hmm. right we want something we can point to something of form but in the end it's really about what we cause to happen in the minds of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, God forbid, but if you had a house fire and everything that was made burned to the ground, you would still have the love that has been planted in you from others and the love that you ex are extending to others. And that's, right. that's ultimately what you've created here. As but, you didn't create it. but you didn't create it. You made it here. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, Robert, one, before we, I know we'll, we probably have another point here on 10, but just real quick, when you say in the last point that um, we can know our creations at any time, how do we do that? What does that mean? 
Well, I think the way we know them has to be, I mean, it, knowing them would be the same basically as knowing God. And that's what the Course calls revelation. It's what we call in our society the mystical experience. Uh, you know, to know our creations would be a state of pure, you know, unified oneness. It would be an experience of pure spirit. It would have nothing to do with form and our physical senses. Uh, so I guess the way we would know them is the same way we know God. It's just that you don't hear people report. You know, I have that they heard, met their creations today. <laughs> right. I have heard near death experiences where people are having an encounter with the light. One of my favorite ones is a guy named Andy, and he was he he nearly drowned at, at the end of the last day of high school. And uh, he was with the light, and the light says, Andy, I love you. And then he hears, and Andy, we love you. And he sees countless billions of, of smaller lights behind the light. Hmm. And I always took that as that's, that's the souls God created. Maybe some of those smaller ones are his creations or our creations. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, is, that is so wild to think about. But I, I, I think just trying to simplify it if we the more we come back to god the more we touch that light then the more we can know love the more we can feel become a clearer channel for that love and the more that love extends through us into the minds of others here on earth that and that that is somehow our earthly reflection of what's actually happening in heaven yeah yeah is that the, that's well the simplest yeah. way to say it yeah the urge to do that on earth ultimately comes from that unlimited desire to do that in heaven mm -hmm. obeying that urge is what leaves our legacy on earth but it's also what opens our mind to creation in god it helps yeah. us remember that the real thing and it is interesting that urge comes from a spiritual source, which therefore makes it a spiritual hardwiring in us, this need to create. Right. And just, just like he, he talks about, even though the way we look for completion, ultimately, you know, the ways in which we look are ultimately false and counterproductive, that desire to be complete is we have a right. That desire is true. We have a right for it to be fulfilled. I think it's the same thing with the creative impulse. Even if we cre try to create, quote unquote, in this world in ways that are ultimately not a good reflection of the real thing, that urge to create, we should affirm. Mm -hmm. and channel it in the right directions on earth so we can get back to the real thing in heaven. I wish we had another word here. I mean, I know that the course makes the distinction between making, which is what we can do in our uh, embodied state and creation, which is what God does in heaven. And, it's, and therefore it's eternal, uh, but it's just, uh, we get tripped up in the language. And yeah. I think that's yeah. it, part and parcel to the confusion that we have around this topic. I think so too. And I think the reason why the course doesn't want to use create in relation to the earth is because a, when you create there's a sense of it being like out of nothing, something truly new, mm -hmm. sense that it's something real and lasting to create. Whereas when you make, you make something out of existing materials mm -hmm. and it may not be this really lasting thing. And the course thinks that that's, that applies to things on earth. You know, we're not really creating like this lasting thing out of nothing because nothing lasts on earth we're always just rearranging existing materials on earth. So it likes the distinction between create and make for, for the reasons of the, for the connotations those two words have in the English language. But yeah, I mean, it, we need more synonyms to cover the full range of situations on earth. I, I feel the same thing. Yeah, and that's what I was getting at earlier. Like I thought we were just rearranging existing souls <laughs> in, our, in our creations, but, but, they're, but they're new. They're new. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's a very interesting topic. And it reminds me of the angels topic because the course is 
saying really directly, this is real. Your creations are real. You miss the whole thing. You miss being their creator. And that's why you're sad and unfulfilled now. Like this is an actual real dimension of our experience. Yeah. And it, and it speaks to so much of the course is around us feeling this longing, feeling some sort of unfulfillment, feeling some kind of anxiety and depression and thinking it's one thing, i.e. the circumstances of the world, mm-hmm. when ultimately it stems from this spiritual um, lack of fulfillment in a certain area. And, and the more we can get in touch with the real source of our unfulfillment and our anxiety and our depression, then you know, the, the more healed we can become and the more we can extend that healing. So these are, I know I rib you on this stuff mercilessly, but it's, it's, it's truly fascinating to pull these things out and, and discuss them in this format. So thank you. And there's so much more we could say on this topic, but we have to just fit it into our time slot. But it's a big topic in the course, mm-hmm. and it and, is fascinating. And it's clear as mud right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Hopefully we have uh, clarified this. But this is also a, a, one of those topics that, like angels, is to be continued because there's just no way that you can sit and talk about it for an hour and have everyone say, ha ha, I understand it now. So we'll continue to to bring this up and, and hopefully one day it'll really go in. <laughs> hopefully.